All right, ladies and gentlemen, and we are here. It is Wednesday, and you know what that means. Time to continue on our series. Wednesday wisdom is what we call it, but really diving deeper into the Corpus Hermeticum, the divine Pymander. Original manuscript, Hermes Trismegistus, 3rd century AD, and we have come a long way in this series. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, all the way to the 14th verse, chapter, book, whatever you want to call it, but I will call it a chapter because it is inside of a book. Hope you got yourself a beverage and are comfy, and we will be diving into the chapter entitled Of Operation and Sense. Now, this is a discourse back and forth between Hermes Trismegistus, sometimes called Pymander or Pomander, also known as the Greek sage god Thoth, and, sorry, Egyptian sage god Thoth, Greek Hermes, a mixture becoming Hermes Trismegistus. This format is in the form of a discourse, and it's a back and forth, a presentation of all of the greatest questions of the nature of reality in the universe and of spirituality and of God. We have found an incredible amount here, but I'm rambling, as you know, already. So let us dive right into of operation and sense and see what we can learn from the Corpus Hermeticum and Hermes and Tristan and Justice in this incredible spiritual philosophy. Once again, thank you for being here. Line number one. Tat said, You have well explained these things, O Father, Tat being the son of Trismegistus. You have well explained these things, O Father, he says. Teach me, furthermore, these things. For you said that science and art were the operations of the rational. But now you say that beasts are unreasonable. And for want of reason, are called brute, and so that by this reason it must needs follow that unreasonable creatures partake not of science or art because they come short of reason. Now this has been spoke about, spoken about many times before earlier in this book about how humanity, or man as it refers to it, but us, men and women, humanity has this ability beyond the very uh, natural state of the animal kingdom. We have this reason as it's referenced, or rational, or rationality. And those things that are unreasonable do not have this quality of rationality, usually referring to the beasts. And then they're, they have different, you know, they call them brute beasts and other things. But he's pointing out here and clarifying, asking Trismegistus to explain to him, as he says, O oh, Father, you have well explained these things, but teach me furthermore about this science and art that are operations of the rational or the reasonable. Reasonable. Na, 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 na. <laughs> He answers and says, number two, it must be so, O son. Todd continued, why then, O father, do we see some unreasonable living creatures use both science and art? And then he gives examples. And these are the most wonderful arguments. It's like if you had a chance to talk to God and you're arguing with God, like, explain to me. <laughs> incredible however he says all right then if this is the case that you tell me that nothing in the the unreasonable kingdom of beasts or animal kingdom we'll say can have this reason therefore they can partake in science and art then how oh father he says do we see some of these unreasonable living creatures using both science and art well give me an example as the ants hoard up for themselves food against winter. And fowls of the air likewise make them nests. And creeping things, beasts, know their own dens, he asks. So how, how are they so smart in using what you could call 
science and art, to prepare themselves and to shape and form nests and dens and so forth, and to gather what they need. These things they do, Hermes Trismegistus replies, O son, not by science or art, but by nature. For science and art are things that are taught. But none of these brute beasts are taught any of these things. See, and it's always just a, um, a minor discrepancy. The most important distinctions. There was a man, Matt Belair, I used to listen to all the time. And he would use that term very, very often, but I always found it very... Um, it was the perf ter perfect term for when he was describing how there is the distinction that can be made about something that separates it from this or that, and it gives you a clear understanding. The greatest distinctions. He says, these things are not science and art, making nests and dens and preparing. These are not things that are taught. These are things of nature. He continues, but these things being natural unto them are wrought by nature, whereas art and science do not happen unto all, but unto some. Six, as men are musicians, but not all, neither are all archers or huntsmen or the rest, but some of them have learned something by the working of science or art. After the same manner also, if some ants did so, and some not, you would thus well say, they gather their food according to science and art. Interesting. So he makes the distinction there, that if some of them did it, and not all of them did it, and some of them did different things and other ones did, which you could also make the argument for that taught, but he says, then that would be what can be described about men and women, humanity. Eight, but being, they are all led by nature. See, doing, there's a difference, and this is a big spiritual subject. The difference between doing and being. And so many of us, and all the time, so much of the time, we're just doing and doing and doing, and we're not just being. That doesn't mean you can't do something while you're being. But are you actually there, in it, totally immersed in the moment? Or are you eating the appetizer, waiting for the meal? And while you're eating the meal, you're not enjoying it because you're thinking of the dessert. This is just a metaphoric example. However, he continues, but being... They are all led by nature to the same thing, even against their wills. It is manifest they do not do it by science or art. It is just what happens naturally. They are not doing it by choice, maybe? He says it is manifest. They do not do it by science or art and even against their own wills. Nine, for operations important word in this philosophy, operation and providence and necessity and a few others there. However, <clears throat> for operations, O taught, being intangible, are in bodies and work by bodies. Wherefore, O taught, in as much as they are intangible, we must say they are immortal. But inasmuch as they cannot act without bodies, I say, they are always in a body. Now this instantly gets really, really deep. What does he mean by intangible? What is really meant by immortal? And what is really meant by the bodies? I'll read through those again and continue at number 12. Number nine, for operations, O Tat, 
being intangible, are in bodies and work by bodies, wherefore, O Tat, and as much as they are intangible, we must say they are immortal. But inasmuch as they cannot act without bodies, I say they are always in a body. For those things that are to anything, or for the cause of anything made subject to providence or necessity, cannot possibly remain idle of their own proper operation. For that which is, shall ever be, for both the body and the life of it is the same. So I think what he's getting at here is the underlying essence that you could say is the operation or activity of anybody. I'm not He's saying body a lot, but I'll just say anybody. Any one of us, ladies and gentlemen, the operation or activity or the life force, energy, essence that is responsible for giving us this remarkable ability to experience reality and the functioning of it, as does all other living creatures, including plants and trees and the bees. But that underlying force, inasmuch as it is intangible, we must say, O Tat, that we are immortal due to that underlying spiritual nature. Remember earlier in this philosophy as well as in the Hermetica, we learned that we have a dual nature. We are both mortal due to our physical nature, which is transitory, and then we are both immortal due to our other spiritual nature, which is not transitory. And then there is the tangible and the intangible, and the corporeal and the incorporeal. And these are all ways of explaining. Then there comes necessity, which is an operation of our being here in the physical realm and nature, which leads to such things as survival, you know, consciousness, to what it was just describing there with the animals. You know, gathering, is it not science and art that they gather and create nests and dens and prepare their food for the winter? This is nature. And this is of necessity of the operation being here. Which is all, once again, broken down in previous chapters in this series. So if you missed any of these episodes, be sure to go back and check all that out. I was just trying to break that really dense bit down there because that was deep. And I'm sure I'm only getting 1% of this. Remember, if you feel like you're getting every bit of this, you're probably not getting very much at all. And if you feel like you're not getting any of this, you're probably getting quite a bit of it. The more you meditate on it, ruminate and ponderate and, you know, think about it, the more that this will come to us. I will remind us now, as I always do, which I find very important, as we go back to the first words of Thrice Greatest Hermes in the Hermetica. And he said to us, remember, pure philosophy is a spiritual striving through constant contemplation to attain true knowledge of Atum, the one God, or simply put, the things that are. Atum Universe, reality, is everything that is. So we can call it the things that are. But most importantly, to understand this pure philosophy, which he lamented that would be lost in the future. And it would only be a later time where those are birthed of an older heaven who are worthy of this pure philosophy. Hmm. I mean, I could go into that, but that was back in the beginning of the Hermetica series. The point here I was getting at is this pure philosophy, this whole understanding of the things that are, is a spiritual striving through a constant contemplation, a constant meditation, ponderation, rumination, and thinking about attaining true knowledge of an understanding of the things that are. And that would take us to the teaching of Hermes Trismegistus' first book in the very beginning of Corpus Hermeticum, and he says, 
write this first book for humanity's sake and both for piety, reverence, honor towards God, a tomb. Number one, teaching. There can be no religion, spiritual pursuit, philosophy, whatever you want to call it, more true or just than to know the things that are. Simple. And I think in our circumstance, seeking to know the things that are. But I mean, if you could really know it all, what then, ladies and gentlemen, what then? Once again, thank you for being here. Hopefully you're getting value. And if you are, consider smashing the like. And if you have already, then give yourself a pat on the back. We are the one percenters, ladies and gentlemen. That was intense. For operations of top being intangible are in bodies and work by bodies. See, the operations, I think, is that, that spiritual part that is immortal, intangible. The underlying essence and sort wherefore, O Tot, inasmuch as they are intangible, we must say they are immortal. Inasmuch as they cannot act without bodies, we are always in a body. Or he says they are always in a body. And he's not really talking about humanity here. He's talking about nature or the ants and the you know animal kingdom. For those things that are to anything, or for the cause of anything made subject to providence or necessity. Cannot possibly remain idle without, wait, cannot possibly remain idle of their own proper operation. So see, it is, this is another way of describing natural function of reality. It's like something you can't get out of because it is the functioning way of this reality. I mean, this might be the computer code to the simulation for those of you that believe that that's what this is. Which is, I mean, an interesting theory. I'm really open to all kinds of theories. And so it's all fun to think because I have an idea that the more that we discover, the more that we'll find that it all is actually really connected. Even some of the wildest theories out there. For that which is shall ever be for both the body and the life of it is the same. See, they are both things of universe, God, this oneness that we are in, this operating system, maybe, to put it technically. Because it is the same. For that which it is shall ever be. For both the body and the life of it is the same. It comes from the same source. And by this reason, I added that last sentence, it comes from the same source. 14, quote, and by this reason it follows that the bodies are also always, because I affirm that this corporeal nature is always by the act and operation or for them. Corporeal nature being physical. Getting incorporeal would be the non-physical. This corporeal nature is always by the act or operation, or for them. For although earthly bodies be subject to dissolution, yet these bodies must be the places and the organs and instruments of action. So it is a necessity for action. See, that goes back to necessity, providence, an operation, which are all big words in this philosophy, they mean like the most important things. Because most of this is trying to describe the functioning of God and reality and how we play, how that is connected to uh, uh, you know us and how, why we would need to understand it a certain way. There are times that the author Hermes says, listen, this isn't really something, even though I've described this, this isn't something you need to know or understand to be here and function in reality. He's like, you're just asking the craziest questions. So here, but by this reason, although earthly bodies be subject to dissolution, see, this is what I was saying is like, even though it is of nature for the life and death process and the creation and dissolution of things, this is like a one process. And so even though from our perspective, it would seem to be different, one life and the other life and this and that, 
the underlying function and essence and source of it all is the same. So what gives me body with physical nature and then life force essence to function with action or operation through providence and necessity of nature is the same thing that's allowing that for everything else. So that would mean that we're all technically immortal. If you look at it from a very different viewpoint than the separate I am, you know, a, a subjective viewpoint rather than a zoomed out objective viewpoint. I mean, this could be really crazy for somebody. So if this is too up in the clouds for you, that's just fine. That's just fine. I get you. I, you know, I've had to read through this whole book and the other one and think about this for years before I get to these thoughts and ramblings. And I don't even know if I'm, if I'm on point, ladies and gentlemen, but like I said, that's not the point. How are you doing, kitten? A kitten uh, interruption, ladies and gentlemen, but that's just fine. By this reason, but actions are immortal and that which is immortal is always in act and therefore also death if it be permanent this is very interesting what do you think i mean tell me what you think in the comments ladies and gentlemen because this we always um, work really good bouncing ideas off each other and this like i said is always open to interpretation and so with that being said So, but actions, let me go back to 14 and continue. No, 13. For that which is shall ever be. For that which is shall ever be. I think that's a strong statement. I mean, every one of these sentiments is very strong. For both the body and the life of it is the same. See, those two things, the body and the life of it. I mean, we don't often talk about those as separate things. Like, yeah, your life of this body. <laughs> you know what I mean? The life of it. And so is the same. And by that reason, it follows that the bodies are also always, because I affirm but this corporeal nature is always by the act or operation or for them. Are you being a kitten? <laughs> and by this reason, for although earthly bodies be subject to dissolution, yet these bodies must be the places and the organs and the instruments of action. But actions are immortal. And that which is immortal is always in act. And therefore, also, death would be permanent. Very different. Once again, I left the, I left the speaker over to the side, which I do sometimes. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, this is one of those subjects that you could read over 150 times and get something different every time. But acts and operations do not follow the soul, yet come not suddenly or promiscuously, but some of them come together with being made man or being about brutish or unreasonable things. But the purer operations do insensibly in the charge of time work with the oblique part of the soul. And these operations depend upon bodies and truly that they are becoming flesh come from the divine bodies into mortal ones. From divine bodies into mortal ones. Even in this philosophy, it is taught from Tahat or Tat, Thoth, Hermes, Tat may 
even. But it is taught that gods are but immortal men, not Atum, of course, the one God or universe. However, gods are but immortal men, and men are but mortal gods. And it is very fascinating to think deeply about what that may mean for us. But every one of them acts in both about the body and the soul, and are present with the soul, even without the body. And they are always operations, but the soul is not always in a mortal body. For it can be without a body, but operations cannot be without bodies. 22. This is a sacred speech, O son. The body cannot consist without a soul. Tot asks, What do you mean, O father? What do you mean? And I love it when he asks these questions. Because this is a perfect spot for us to continue to ponder on that. And I think since today is a busy day, ladies and gentlemen, I'll have to cut it short there. You're probably going, no, don't do it. <laughs> the next thing he says is, understand this, O Tot. When the soul is separated from the body, the body remains. And this same body, according to the time of its abode, is actuated or operated in that it is and becomes invisible. But we'll leave the rest of that till next time because I can see I will continue going for another 40 minutes until I get to the end of that. And this one I think I want to spend a little more time on next week so we can try to get the real try to get the real juice out of this the real meaning the real wisdom and understanding because often when you do let it sit in the mind for a little bit of time you come to something else that makes more sense of it but i love that line number 22 this is a sacred speech oh son this is a sacred speech. The soul is not always in a mortal body, for it can be without a body. But the body cannot consist without a soul. So what are we, ladies and gentlemen? Are we human beings who every now and then have a temporary spiritual experience? Or are we spiritual beings who are just here having a temporary human experience. A temporary human experience. <laughs> Exciteful today. I think she's starting to enjoy when I do these videos. She likes to come over and hang out and go in circles and do stuff, but it's whatever. I just try to stay focused as much as I can, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Once again, I love and appreciate each and every one of you that spends time here with me in these premieres and in the chat room and just spends time with me in Hermes Trismegistus, Egyptian sage God Thoth, as well as Dr. David Hawkins on Tuesdays and Dr. Wayne W. Dyer and Lao Tzu and all the other wonderful authors and poets and mystics and philosophers and sages of the ages. Ladies and gentlemen, be sure to subscribe if you haven't. And share this with like-minded people. It helps support the work that we do here as well. Be sure to expand the description. I have a Amazon affiliate link. I think I've made like six cents off of there and all this time. And I never really even asked to have it paid out because I'm like, what's the purpose? So the purpose of those links, ladies and gentlemen, is so you can get these books for yourself for reference. Follow along in the future or just for personal reference, for yourself, so you can have them on your shelf. And also, ladies and gentlemen, a link to my Etsy shop, my landscape paintings, if you'd like to get one of them for yourself. And also a link to C60 Purple Power. Give yourself the gift of health. But remember, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. 
So if we can bring happiness to life, all the things we've been telling ourselves, oh, when I know this much or have a house and comes irrelevant when we are there. And then hopefully the whole journey is wonderful. And also seek to achieve and maintain happiness through enlightenment, through a greater awareness and a greater understanding of the nature of reality. Seek to discover the hidden wisdom of the ages and the lost mysteries of our history. All right. Love you, ladies and gentlemen. Until next week, be the change you want to see. Na -na 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 -na.